I was at a meeting of the Women's Pentagon Action, which was extremely important in terms of the formation of the camp, because it was the, um, there was a series of gatherings, and I think it was 1980 and 1981, um, where women had surrounded the Pentagon. And out of those actions, splinter groups in different cities emerged, and a big one was in New York, Women's Pentagon Action. And I had, at that time, I was working with something called the Women's Committee to Support Medgar Evers College out of Brooklyn. And um, we were, uh, so it was an African-American, mostly a women's college in Brooklyn. And I had come to the Women's Pentagon Action to try and support, um, I'm trying to get support for what we were doing. And I was actually kind of shocked at there was somewhat lack of interest. They said, why don't you go talk to some people in Brooklyn? But anyway, that's a whole other subject. Uh, but at that action is where I heard about the organizing. Well, I heard about Greenham for the first time, you know, what was happening, and for the organizing for the peace camp. And I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. So, but I had been to both the two women's Pentagon actions. And one of the significant um, points of that, I was, I guess I was at college in Ohio at Oberlin, and um, I had come down from Ohio and walked into this room of, you know, thousands of women, and it was very na naively, I remember thinking, it, it was very hard to accept that it was all women, that you, your mind naturally could, you know, could make could see men out of the construction. And I remember that sort of challenged me and took me by surprise that these were all women. So anyway, that's where I first heard about it. And, um, and I, then I went to the organizing meetings in New York, where a lot of the early people who were involved were meeting. And I was somewhat put off, to be honest, by some of, by some of the women. I thought they were um, a little arrogant, but, but a lot of women were, were quite accepting and nice. And, um, and at the same time, I had been working with something called the Media Network. Those were my two main projects, and it was the Women's Committee for Medgar Evers College and Media Network. And what Media Network was, was an organization based out of New York that was trying to promote the use of documentary film as an educational tool in different communities. And that was my, my main interest. Of, I thought I was going to be a filmmaker. That's what I wanted to do at that point. And um, Media Network was trying to engage communities to make films and then distribute them. And through Media Network, I was exposed to all the incredible documentaries that were out there. And then I started to realize that all, there, there were so many documentaries. Really, the documentaries didn't need to be made that what was important was that these films get shown. And that's, in some ways, I still feel that's some of the most important work, like with the work here with the, this project that you're doing. I mean, now we gotta get it out there, you know? Um, and always there's so much great work that's produced, but it needs to be seen. So I was, and oh, at that point, Media Network was kinda hip, and I, there were all these, we'd have like benefits at the, not the pyramid, but, I can't remember the hip club, so we got to meet um, movie stars and stuff. So it was kind of that was kind of fun. And um, I was at Danceteria, and Mark Weiss, who was the guy who ended up, oh, he got kicked. Like so many organizations, um, the people who start them, they have to get kicked out because they don't, you know, they're too controlling. And even like like Steve Jobs at Apple and stuff. And um, so they eventually they kicked out Mark Weiss, but from Media Network, but. He started Point of View on NPR, and so he went on. And so, like, what he ended up getting the ultimate forum for these wonderful documentaries. So I'm, I'm happy for him for that. Anyway, he said, "I said, oh, you know, we're at the Institute." He said, "Well, you know, there's this." Um, um, I said, "I was telling him about the peace camp that was forming." He goes, "Well, wouldn't it be great to have a film series there?" And I said, "Oh, that would be a great idea." So, what I decided to do was. To do a film, as so I went to the organizers and I said, "How what would you know? What would it be like to have a film series out in the summer of '83?" And they said, "Sure, I guess." I don't remember what they said, but somehow it was approved. And actually, I don't remember that discussion at all. But 
hope I asked. I think I probably did. Um, and so I spent this July. I guess I quit. I was working at Nuclear Times magazine, and that's also where. Oh, that's also that's also how I got involved with the nu anti-nuclear issue because I saw this information coming across my desk about what was going around around the world, and I guess that's also where I heard more about Greenham. And um, you know, the freeze movement was really big then. I guess the big demonstration was in '82 with the, how many million people? It was like a million people, December 12th, '82, I think. And um, so it was a convergence of different influences in my life, and so I quit. But luckily, Jack Berkowitz fired me, so I got unemployment. So federal government paid me for a few, quite a number of months, so that I could. I spent June, Jul, June and July, contacting film distribution companies and asked for would they be willing to be part of this fabulous thing, to, you know, make a film series. And everybody said yes. And and really, a, a, in terms of something I actually accomplished in my life, I, this is really one of the high points that. Um, it was really a time where the much much of the peace movement and I mean social issue movements were white social issue movements, uh, European American were getting it that so many of the issues were connected, and so, so much of the feminist movement and the, and the anti -fem, I mean the feminist. I can't see. Oh, just I'm just thinking of volume. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't say. Sorry, that was just interesting. You're fine. Okay, but um, I, mean, I can I can see your outlines. I can hear I can, you great. I can't great see your expression, so no, that's okay. Um, thank you. Um, that it was a time in the late '70s, early '80s, where people were finally white people were getting making connections with all the different movements, and and so by contacting all these different um, organizations that have been making these incredible documentaries like about Nicaragua and El Salvador and like the killing of the nuns and about violence against women and you know personal development and giving these films that in, when we finally pulled together this film series that meant that every night in August we'd go into the barn and we all I borrowed this old 16 millimeter, oh yeah 16 millimeter films, that's what we had, God. This old rickety um, projector from a local school. I can't remember even where that was. And so every night there'd be these films, and each night was a different topic. And, um, you know, so in some ways I felt that by having this film series, it, besides all the, I mean, that summer was just so incredible because there was workshops and um, every day that also were highlighting all these different issues. So this was just another aspect of what the encampment was doing by bringing together and exposing women who had come from many different places to all these other issues at the same time that we were going out and protesting during the day. So that was a long answer. Um, but So that's what I did. So I, I wasn't there in June and July. I wasn't there for the 4th of July action. I didn't get there till right before the August 1st action. And then was there all summer and stayed through till about October when all the discussion about what was going to happen to the land because that was so painful. Before you get to that, what was, oh, sorry. To, that's, I, I wanted to, like, so what were your first impressions when you got to the when land? To the land. You had um, well, I came with my sister. I think Sally Chu, and maybe even Allison Bechdel and her partner at the time, Alyssa Oppenheimer. I think we all came up together. Um, and it was just amazing to come on the land and see all what women had been creating and um, have this feeling of possibility and what we can do, and it was also ch 
challenging and frightening immediately. And um, I've written about this in the IRS article, but it really was pivotal. Okay, I remember the first thing that happened is I walked on, I walked into the office, and who was there? Jody Bear. And I said, well, what can I do to help? And Jody said, well, we need these cabinets put up in the sales tent shed over there. And so here's the cabinets, here's some nails, go do it. You know, and I'm not someone who had done a lot of that kind of work. And really, I mean, I think it was within 15 minutes of, of arriving. And I, and I was like, you know, and Jody, you know, Jody, and I thought she was really cute, but she was um, kind of, you know, direct. And so I, so I, I mean, I was always, I've always been kind of strong, and I brought the cab, you know, cabinets to the sales tent, and I really just, I felt like somebody, I mean, I still have this issue, like, if, if you're going to do something, it should be done right, and somebody must know how to do this better than I know how to do this, and so, and nobody's telling me how to do this. Um, and so where are the experts, you know, who's going to train me how to do this? And I really got like, well, you're here, this needs to be done, you need to do it. And, you know, I put up the cabinet somehow, and, and they, as far as I know, they lasted all summer. Um, so that was really important for me. And Did you camp that first summer? Were uh, you, like, in a tent, or uh, yeah, I, where'd you stay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm laughing because I didn't tend to camp too much, but, um, uh, yes, I camped. I was with my sister, and um, I stayed, I believe, in Amazon Acres. And the other thing I remember was the first night um, doing security with my sister. And at that point, you know, there were four hours security, 24 hours, well, I guess, no, in the night, I guess we had security shifts. I don't think we had them in the day. So starting as it, it got dark, there were four hour security shifts. And I think ours was from uh, four to eight. And um, so I sat up with my sister, who's four years younger than me. So I would have been 25, she would have been 21. And um, just being there and being aware that there are all these women sleeping all around us and hearing the crickets and, um, oh, and, oh, right, and we had our walkie-talkie, <laughs> right? I remember the walkie, and so, and then, so people would uh, talk on the phones and chat with they make jokes, and, oh, and then people would bring us coffee, and so there was this real sense of, you know, like we were taking care of business and, and talking on the, you know, I would say the, Roger out or you know something like that, and um, and and then watching the sun come up and the life of the camp start, and I just remember being really impressed by the how the um, sinks were set up and and um, you know, and the kitchen and how everything was organized and like how do they know how to do all this and and that it was all very and then all the the little women whimsical signs and and then the women camping and coming from all different places, um, from so many parts of the country. Because I, 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 I guess I was there at the biggest, I guess, right, August 1st was the biggest action. So the other thing, though, is I had just had my four wisdom teeth pulled. <laughs> so I also remember going, being sort of like in a daze. Um, but, and then the, that action and just the color and the drama. Oh, and then the women got, was that before? Just before. The, the 54. Okay, so I must have been, I, I think I got there, the, I think I got there as that was happening, as they were, because um, I wasn't, I didn't see anything of the sit, the sit down, where they were actually at the Bridge of Waterloo. So I got there that afternoon, I got there, then how did I put up the chairs? <laughs> well, anyway, so, um, no, I guess because there was probably time. I mean, there's things going on. So I, um, you know what? Okay, sorry. I think the first time I went up there was with Alyssa Oppenheimer. And that's when I put up the sheds. And that's when I met Jody. And that was sometime in June when things were just starting in the, or July. And then the next time was with my sister. And then, okay, and then Waterloo 54. And then, so it was just happening. We got there and there was the women walking around, um, I think I saw that in the movie, but anyway, so the, I remember that there was a big meeting, and I remember coming to this meeting, it was dusk, 
and women were, you know, huge mass meeting, and women were standing up and saying, what should we, because we had to figure out what to do. So they were informing people, and then um, just being really impressed at how articulate and strong these people were, and how they seemed to know what to do. And um, How did you know that something had happened? And explain it, because so far you guys haven't said what you're talking about. Oh, thank you. Um, Okay, so I'm talking about when the women were stopped at the bridge at Waterloo. When there was, it was actually when mostly women's Pentagon action people from New York who had come up and their plan was to go from Seneca Falls to the encampment, I believe. So they had been stopped by a crowd. And then because the police didn't want to have a ruckus, they just, and the women sat down to stop, I mean to deal with what was going on, the, said to be nonviolent, and so the women ended up getting arrested. I found out, I think I found out because there was that mess. I mean, probably I found out because people were talking about it. It was probably just the whole buzz of the encampment as you arrived. Um, and then there was the mass meeting. So, and I think it was that night that we all went over to the prison, the school, the jail at Interlaken. And, and so there was a vigil over there and I, I'm trying to figure how we got there, if there were shuttles. There was probably shuttles organized or individual cars. And then going through the little town of Romney, you know. I mean, I think the first time I came to the encampment it was just so sweet and, and you know, a little house. It was different than I, I think I expected it. Um, and then going through the little town of Romulus and then to Interlaken. And, and then there was a Lodi, it was the next town over. Um, I, I don't think I stayed very long at the jail and then coming back. So you were, you had a niche to get into. You were going to be By doing, doing the films. film series, right. Right, but um, I do remember feeling intimidated by a lot of the organizers. And it wasn't until several years later that I came to full, I mean, I, I totally take that on myself. I don't feel there was anything they did. They were just competent in doing what they were supposed to do. Um, but it wasn't until years later that when I finally started reading more about consensus and nonviolence theory that I realized that there was a whole analysis and all you really needed to do was read it <laughs> and talk about it. And they weren't miracle workers, but they had been, that, that there was this whole cadre of women who had sort of come out of um, War, Resist War Resisters League and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and, um, well, there were these groups who had been doing Griffiths Air Force Base and, and they were, there were affinity groups that had been set up since the late 70s and a lot of these groups grew out of movement for a new society out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no clue that this whole world existed um, and that there was this cohesion and, you know, this movement that really knew each other and um, had ideology and understanding and strategies and tools for how best to accomplish what needed to be accomplished. So had... <coughs> I didn't know, I didn't get that. Right, right away. From the camp. And you I, didn't there was a lack of being able to really communicate that, I think. Um, and there was, I, I mean, maybe whenever there's a situation where you have this huge task ahead of you and so much to be done, and, and, I, and suddenly you're faced with thousands of women showing up and the, the project and all the media coverage, I think there was a sort of, um, uh, what's the word, were you? Hoard together, you know, like hunkering down. Hunkering down, yeah. <laughs> um, where people had to kind of c connect with each other, and there was a sort of in group and out group kind of phenomena, which I think is is natural. I think at the time I felt, you know, a little put off by that. But in, had you been part of an affinity group at that point up to that time? Um, not I. Yes, um, at, at Overland, we, I'd been part of the Seabrook. Um, that was my very first. Uh, action was at the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. We came out from Oberlin in 79, I think. 
And that was my first exposure to this. And, but I was still, I was older than most of the people, I don't know why. But none of my social people, you know, um, were connected to that. So I was, I was, I became part of an affinity group, and I actually made some good friends from that. Um, and that was the first time I saw, uh, I remember arriving to Seabrook in the, is that okay? Can I talk about this? Um, I remember arriving to Seabrook at, at, in the pouring rain, and there was a spokes council meeting, and there were all, it was men, men and women, and um, actually I wasn't lesbian. Right? I wasn't. And, um, and they all had their cloaks, and, and, and it felt like I was in this Middle Ages, um, you know, count, with the spokes council, and all the little groups and the affinity groups. And then I, I remember, that was the first time, and then there was Lesbian Tide. And that was this whole, um, uh, so it gives me shivers, there was this whole group of women, I think mostly from Boston and Connecticut, who had affinity groups, and they, be, they were this whole huge cohort within affinity groups, and they were just so cool. <laughs> I remember Lesbian Tide. Yeah, anyway, so that was, uh, so I, I think I was slow. I was part of something called the Women's Collective at Oberlin. We did, we worked by consensus, but I didn't, I didn't know the theory. <clears throat> so you were there for the August action. I was, that was the first big action. Right, that, so I was there for that, yeah. And when, give us your, uh, talk action. about that a little bit. I have to say, I th maybe it's because I was like, had my molars out, but I don't, I just remember, like it was big and colorful, and there was a march, and um, I don't have anything really significant to remember about that at all. It just it was big in a march, and um, oh, I remember um, there was one thing I remember is that there was a woman who went over the fence who had crutches, <laughs> right? And I thought that was pretty impressive. Did you have a sense when you first arrived of what the point of the camp was or its time frame? I think that I was always a little out of kilter with what the point of the camp was, that I had my idea of what the point of the camp was, um, which was to create the links, that we were fighting patriarchy and capitalism in all its forms, and that the point of the camp was definitely to call attention to the cruise and Persian two missiles, um, that, you know, we were on the brink of nuclear war if the world didn't get it together to say this is crazy and that, you know, the, with the nuclear buildup. So this, I, I did see this as a strategy for calling attention very specifically to the deployment that was about to happen. Um, but I, right from the start, it seemed like this was a place where there could be the convergence of all the issues, and that felt really, really important and powerful. And I felt that that wasn't just, I felt that, you know, that's what Women's Pentagon Action was about, too. That's why I was upset. And I, I, that when I went to go speak to them about Maker Evers, I thought, like, I'd be there. I mean, this would be just the perfect issue. And that was my first lesson in, like, well, maybe these white women are not quite as, you know, they talk the talk but don't walk the walk. But so, um, but I, I think in their hearts or in their minds or someplace <laughs> that there was this idea that you needed to make these links. And I saw the encampment as that, that was the point of that. But I, in retrospect, I'm not sure that that was as much of the point as of the organizers. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things that's so important always to remember about encampment is that it totally did believe and did reflect in the multiplicity of points of view and that the encampment was this huge gathering of so many different ideas and opinions and women and that I think if anything else it remained true makes me cry. it remained true to the um, honoring and belief that all points of view had validity and needed to be respected. And I, I think when you look back through the archives that that was consistent, that in the final decision, and sometimes it weakened the encampment, but in the final decision that there was a respect for honoring multiplicity. 
Andrea, so the first summer you spent all of August there. How did you stay longer than that? I stayed till um, I decided. Oh, okay. So it it became clear to me, and this is something I really feel. Rather uh, quickly, I mean, this, if I had one thing to take away from the camp, and this ties into answering your question, um, is that the encampment was a place where we could live our vision, to actually live in day-to-day -day reality how we wanted the world to be, to actually practice the revolution. And it gave us that opportunity, and that for my, for me, at that point in my life, was just a blessing and the most important opportunity that I could imagine. So, I was one of the people who could not even imagine how could we close the encampment. I mean, here we have this opportunity, and to close it. But being the good little Gemini Pisces and um, pet sitter, as Jody Bear always used to accuse me of. Um, I could also see that there were these cadre of women who had worked really hard to create this, and I felt I felt pretty much that if I didn't want to be a consensus blocker in terms of continuing the encampment, I wanted the process to take its place and to respect the points of view of the collective. So I felt strongly that it should keep going, but I wasn't going to go out there and fight for it to keep going. So my, my feeling was, if it kept going, I was going to pull up roots from New York. So I guess I had an apartment on the Lower East Side, and um, 12th Street, I think. And um, I was going to pick up roots and move to the camp, and if they decide to close it, I wasn't going to do that. So I went to the big meeting in uh -huh. Albany, yeah, and um, which was such a painful meeting. I mean, actually, I don't know what records there exists of that meeting, but I bet there are records. Um, and I just stayed in the background. I mean, I was pretty much a background kind of stayer to begin with. Um, and when they dis when the decision was, I guess it wasn't even the decision. I think it was a fallback. It was a fallback decision because there had never been a plan for what to do after it closed. So since they couldn't agree, it just stayed open. I think that's what happened. Um, and so that was in October. So then I went home. Do you want to pause for a second? Ready? We don't have this part yet, do we? Um, in the archives. At the end of the summer it was not clear about what was going to happen to the encampment. And the women who organized it initially had put a plan in place for what was going to happen at the end of the summer. I think their assumption was that at the end of the summer it would you know, close, I guess. But of course there was this property that they had bought for $37,000, which they had quickly raised the money for. Oh, during the course of the summer through donations. And so there was a, a consensus that there would be another meeting in Albany in October. I, I guess I think we called it the October meeting back then. And that what was going to happen to the encampment. And already there were uh, you know, block, blocks forming about we well, should close the encampment, we should keep the encampment going, we should give it to the Cayuga. Um, I might be making that up about the Cayuga. But actually, no, I, in one of the interviews I heard that Barbrielle said that they were thinking of doing that. So, okay. Um, and you had this split between the New York uh, and Philadelphia, the, basically the urban organizing women who came out of the peace and social justice movements. And the more the Landyke, Landyke women who had a history of living on land but who had found a place to 
really try and live the revolution. You know, I'm not going to say that's completely true because there were also social activist women who wanted to keep it going. Can I cut that? <laughs> okay. Um, let me start that again. So you had this block forming of different points of view of should the camp keep going or should it close down? And I think a lot of the initial, mostly urban, organizing women of uh, from Philadelphia, Boston, and New York were scared of, they, they created this baby, they weren't going to pick up their lives and go live in upstate New York, and what was going to happen? And you had this influx of lots of women with, who were in some ways extremely radical, wanting to create a space to continue the work and also to live an alternative lifestyle. Um, and the, the political, social activists, urban women didn't trust what was going to was going to happen. I think, um, and but in the end, because there had been no decision in place, and the way consensus work is, if you can't come up with a decision, you go for the fallback, and the fallback was that the camp was open. So the compromise, though, was that there was at the end of the summer thirty-seven thousand dollars left over. And so women felt that with this money, because the encampment was an expression of organizing and fighting for all these different social issues, that the money should be given back to the communities from which it came from to support continued peace and social justice and anti-racism work. Um, and then this whole process was set up to do that, which I don't believe was that highly successful. Um, but I think it, I think the money was distributed, as said, but I think it took a while. And, um, anyway, for me personally, so I went back to New York and I picked up, when the decision was it was going to continue, I didn't return till March of 84, and then ended up living at the camp from March of 84 to August of 86. Yes. At which point I moved in to live with a woman that I had met on the land who was from Gen Geneva, um, which was a little town of um, who, uh, Brenda Miller. And um, we lived together for a year and a half or two years. And um, yeah. So tell us about your experience living on the land. Um, so many different experiences. Um, Can we start with when you came back in March? Were you yeah. assuming you were going to stay for two years? What was your intentions when you came That's back? That's a good question. I, didn't, I don't think I had, I just came back to support the encampment. And um, there were, there was just about seven, or six or seven women. It was Leanne, Irwin, Asia. Riggs, Twilight, Twilight, and Twilight and Leanne were a couple. Jody Bear was still there. Jody Bear? Was yeah, she? I think you're right. Um, so my, no, I didn't, I don't think I had a plan. And we just set about trying to plan for, was Anne, um, Anne, who died? Uh, was she living there? No. She was in, you know, Anne and, um, you know Anne. I'm not sure. She, she died. Her her ashes are buried on the land. She. Oh no, not Anne. Anne. She her lived. girlfriend died. Oh. Slash, yeah. <laughs> right. No, Anne. Her girlfriend died. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, right. But they were dating. They, they lived, lived in Rochester. Rochester, right. But they were kind of the force behind right. the '84 action. They were really big force. A call to arms. Right. And call to action. I call to action. Call to arms. I, I'm sorry. But, and they were, and they, she was also, Anne was very electorally minded, I think, more than some of us. And she would be a good person to interview. And, um... Now that she's not dead, we might do that. <laughs> yes. okay. all, the, all this time <laughs> I've been thinking that it was her ashes on 
Yeah. Jane Sleeshman. Jane, right. Oh, That's a, okay. and you can't be expected to yeah. well, remember all the names and so, well, so many people. Gosh, it's pretty big, but, um, so um, Anne was right, and so that was the, I, the idea, which was not really my kind of thing, but it was to, 20, 84 was focused around um, the ERA. I guess the ERA was still getting decided on. It hadn't been not voted down yet, the Equal Rights Amendment. And so uh, August 26, I think, or something, was a day when it was first introduced in 1920 or something, I mean, some long time ago. And um, the focus was to go to Seneca Falls. Right, and so we, so we said, and me, you know, we, we were going to just, we, we were going to learn from all whatever did not work in 83, which so much did work, but, you know, one of the main things was there was something called community outreach. Um, and the, the idea was to communicate with the local area and how to, you know what, I need to stop. You want to say yeah, it? Yeah, so turn it back on. But I, I spent all last night trying to remember the name for this because it was really important. I just remember the reason I wanted to go back was right from the beginning. I did, because I was Miss, like, community communication person, even back from Oberlin. Like, how do we take our radical ideas, I completely forgot about this. How do we take our radical ideas and talk to everyone, the average folks? And I felt like, in general, radical ideas were misrepresented in the media, were misunderstood and not discussed, which is still true today, of course. And, and I also felt like so much is about perspective and how you approach things. And so the idea of the term community outreach, when we did it again, and I can't remember, we called it something else that had to do with like interchange or something. Do you mind? Have any remember? It was like local, no, local dialogue? Lo local dialogue or something. So the idea which was that it's not us outreaching to you, but that we all have to change the world. Everyone has something valuable to say. Local dialogue? Okay, something like that. And so um, that's what we, we needed to listen and communicate and acknowledge the, the inherent value of everybody on both sides. And that there wasn't, I mean, and I do think that, and I think most people who were organizers in 83 would acknowledge that there was arrogance of we have the message and we will teach you and you know it still goes on today I'm sure I still do it all the time in my everyday life um, but to really shift the emphasis that we as an encampment and I think that was part of my codependence and sort of general um, style in life that you know a, a being good Swedish Lutheran that we needed to um, bring who we were and, and have interchange with people in the area that was respectful and that we could learn. So that's why I went back there, to do that. And I can't remember the name of what I wanted to do, local dialogue, something like that. And um, community dialogue, maybe community dialogue? Oh yeah, it was called local outreach, that's what it was. Originally it's local outreach, and I think that was Barbara Rael's position. And the idea was to change it to community dialogue. And but, and then we were going to, okay, and all the things there was, you know, because in the first summer, which of course was fabulous, <laughs> I don't know where we were criticizing it, but um, that we were going to have pe coordinators responsible for all the different areas. So that's what we had, what we had, like 16 positions or something, Estelle? Um, so there was child care coordinator, um, you know, local dialogue, uh, orientation coordinator, I mean, there's like 16 jobs. And, and then we, oh, and, but then the problem was, so we advertised them, and maybe it's because we, I think we paid like $200 a week, which we, back then wasn't so little. It was actually pretty decent. And we, we advertised right and left, but hardly anybody <laughs> applied for the jobs. So basically, whoever applied basically got the job. Um, you know, which was great. And so we had our staff, which about 14 or 12 or something, and, um, and we set about planning for 84. And there was a, a sense, there was a 
finance committee, and there was um, there was a lot of oh and oh and the whole goal was to become permanent. So Jody Bear and Shad and people were all involved with um, establishing what we needed to do to meet the regulations. So we had to put in the permanent toilets and right. So that was the real focus of '84 was how to become permanent and how to meet the regulations. And so it just it shifted the whole energy and. Since it was ERA August 26, and we were in community dialogue, there was a kind of real shift, which I'm just realizing now as I'm speaking to you. To it, so sort of inherently, it became more conservative because you're there. You know, it's not just psh, action short, but you're there you're talking to the community. You want to be respectful. You're meeting the regulations. You're meeting with you. That's also when Pam Andaga she changed her name. Um, it was media coordinator. She was really, really good at what she did, and um, um, and there was all those. I ne see again. I'm in the background. I never was part of any of the meetings for um, meeting with the officials or the police or regulations and all that kind of stuff. And so that was that summer. <laughs> and what what were you doing That's that summer? You, you were up. doing outreach. You showed up in '85. What was I doing? I don't remember. I think I was the orientation. I was the orientation coordinator. Oh, and this is what I remember learning. I was two or Julie Gress was the other orientation coordinator. We oriented together for a little bit. And um, <laughs> and um, so right, and I, this is one thing I remember learning because that as orientation coordinator, I remember greeting people and meeting people, and I learned for myself how much energy it takes just to do that. I remember at the end of the day being so exhausted because when you interact with people that way, it's this, you know, you're just giving of your, I, I didn't think of my, I didn't know it was a giving of yourself, but you're engaging, and I just remember that, right? remember anything else. <laughs> You made a bunch of notes last night, Andrea. Oh, oh I have lots of notes, but they're not about the summer reading. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's okay. Um, so keep, you keep moving then. What yeah, yeah. No, no. How did so, the 84 summer change into um, the winter of 84? So, okay, so then, when did you come? The Mother's Day in 85. Early summer 85. You guys had a winter. So when, when did you start living there? Oh, I didn't live there until much, much later. What does this have to do with you? I, I was just there all the time. Okay. I'm just trying to frame things. So do you remember anything else from the summer of 84? <laughs> <laughs> I remember a lot. Okay. Um, I remember, it was, I remember being mostly painful. Really? Do you? Go there. I just, because, I mean, you know, when I look back, it was not my most shining moment. <laughs> I remember having a very, you know, a vision of how it should be and what we could do and the potential and just constantly feeling like we were falling short. And my one huge regret in my life is that I just wish I had more fun, you know. I mean, I remember feeling like there's all this work that needs to be done, you know, and I was called one of the clip we had the clipboard ladies in the land dike no, no land the grunts. Land what? The grunts. The grunts. No, I call them something else. I didn't call them grunts. Land something else. Um and I I yeah, I meant, oh because I was there in March I moved into the room in the <laughs> top floor and I you know, I didn't have a lot of space or anything, but I would work and then I would crawl up to the attic and oh and I remember I think that spring of 84, I was so happy, you know, I was just like, oh my god, I could do what I wanted to do 24-7, you know, do organizing, and we, you know, we were, um, we, we did the newsletter, I think, no, maybe not then, but we just, we just did all the organizing and the talking and the writing of articles, and, um, and I remember, I actually developed a bladder problem because I couldn't get to get, because we were in the outhouse, and so to actually get up and go to the bathroom was like, um, and oh, and they, you know, of course, there was. I think you know, I went through a series of girlfriends, but usually it was whoever you know was there. <laughs> and so there was um, Asia Riggs was there, so we became girlfriends. 
in the you March. You became a lesbian when? Oh, no, that was... Um, she came as a lesbian. That, that was in Oberlin, in Ohio. Oh, okay. And uh, that was in my senior year. And I lived in the women's collective, and Alison Bechtel was my first collective. And I, I, still, I still love her very much. And um, so Asia and we... Oh, and Asia and I worked together really well. And we had similar vision. Anyway, so I guess when my point was that at my one regret is that I really felt I, I, I went around with a lot of like, well, what are all these? <laughs> what are they doing singing in the woods? And you know, I think I even was like, oh, healing room, you know, oh, hocus pocus, you know. Um, and um, and you know, I was who I was, and um, but. It, it wasn't until probably two years later, probably until I left the encampment, really. Hopefully, I'd like to say when I was there, but that I really got it, that really, I mean, this is very painful, but the work I was doing was very important, but it wasn't, it wasn't, like that you could do, the work I was doing you could do anywhere. But the real uh, message and uniqueness and, um, value and revolution and expression of what the encampment was about was the interchange between women and what was going on around the fire and the relationships and how people communicated and the singing and the um, and the healing room. I mean, my God, the healing room was and all the alternative medicine and the all the healers in all their different uh, forms that came. Like, oh, remember Victoria, Barbara? And I mean, she did something called like necro sacro something, you know, <laughs> the uh, chiropractory, and um, that that. And so, I mean, I I did get that. I mean, I knew that that was important, but I mean, and and honestly, if it wasn't for the work that we did in the office, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have continued because we had to have some money coming in. We had to have some publicity. So I'm not trying to devalue our work, but um, but for. This, this, I guess slowly I got and other people got that the work, what was going on, what became powerful at the camp in 84 and then changing to 85 was that the, yes, our political impact in terms of our speeches and our actions was important, but that the encampment was a place where women were having different kinds of relationships and looking at the anger and the, and the victimization and the um, resentments and the lack of communication and the denial and the silence and the uh, racism, uh, internalized sexism, homophobia, you know, anti-Semitism inside ourselves and that this was a place to challenge all of that and get support in transforming ourselves as individuals to become more loving, more strong, more supportive, you know, more accepting of each individual, more aware of the kind of uh, systematic, you know, oppressions that existed in, in the world, um, and that the camera was a place to really practice doing that and to get support doing that. Um, I do feel that, and I, I felt this throughout my life in every single group that I've been in, that I've always searched for the come. Oh, and I guess I was slowly becoming to explore more spirituality, because I guess I, I didn't at that point. Um, which is, that was funny to think about that. But um, when I left the encampment, I went to join a group called uh, the Pilgrim Warrior Training, because it's an incredible woman who was very part of 83, because she did a lot of the civil disobedience trainings and grew out of movement for a new society and um, called Sandra Boston de Sylvia. And I went to go live with her for six weeks when I left the encampment um, after going to Big Mountain for a month uh, out in the in Arizona. Um, so I left the camp, and I left Geneva and went out to Big Mountain and then went to live with Sandra because she was the first person I saw that was integrating spirituality and radical politics in terms of uh, an analysis of capitalism and racism. And even though she's not big on the racism part, but you know, looking at class structure and um, and integrating and how could we.
be used integrate our social activism, I mean our political analysis and so with spirituality. So what I'm trying to say, that's what I mean about not the good talking, um, is that at the encamp oh, that what I've always experienced in many different groups is usually you either have women who are like, you know, new age, everything's gonna be cool, just accept that accept that it's all gonna work out and goddess is with us. Um, but not too big on being angry and naming the fact that there's a lot of people who are really being, you know, fucked over in the world just because of greed and corporate structure and um, and just are happy to say it's all going to work out, you know, and you know, let's do our little farming and and then you have the political people who are, oh, you know, we got to fuck the man and, you know, the power structure and, um, you know, but are not willing to take care of their bodies and um, and treat each other with respect and, and you know be able to be in the moment and be present. You know, and I struggle with this in myself every day. Uh, though I think there's a lot since 1987 or 86 when I left the land. Um, I think there's a lot more people being able to integrate it a lot more, but it's still not as cohesive as would be great. I think. I forget what your question was. <laughs> um, Tell us about moving out of the summer of 84 into the... Yeah, so then, um, I think that, um, and it wasn't until just now thinking about this, that, so then, so we had this more sort of conservative shift in 84, conservative in the term, term of trying to keep things more stable, more consolidation, more acceptable, more communicating. Um, then all of a sudden, Wait, when did you come? <laughs> the next year, summer of 85. But when? You have the winter. You have a when in the summer? Early May. So I think for some reason, over the course of the spring of um, 85, we just got, maybe because of Greenham, or you know, we were coming in from Greenham Common, coming to visit, or we just got this influx of much more young, separatist, lesbian, radical, you know, like confrontational energy, which was, you know, energizing. And I, and I think I was also at that point, I was, I mean, I was like, oh God, you know, there's so much work to be done. And I think I finally, my ego was, you know, being battered down enough, and I'm, I'm acting like it was me alone, which is not true. I just can't remember the whole thing. But I mean, it was a, there was groups of people, and there was a lot of oh, like Leanne was like me, and Leanne. I mean, there was a lot of Doreen. There, there were a lot of people who were more of this vision of like this is how it's supposed to be, and we got to organize. And um, of women who just were coming in like you know, fire and singing and and having sex and, and uh, I mean not that we didn't have sex but you know it was more like about the relationships and um, and and a radical analysis of patriarchy and separ it was separatism I guess and so it was like well this is a peace camp you know we want to be open to everybody and you know when men are human beings but this real like you know men's fuck suck and fuck the patriarchy and um, it was challenging, but I think it was, and oh, I guess my point was that I think I was more like, whatever. <laughs> you know, I probably, probably people knowing me back then would not say that that's what I was doing, but um, I think that inside myself, it was it was uh, like a release of like, okay, this is who we, right, we also had this burden of 83, and the burden of the women in New York, <laughs> who had this fantasy of those women, and the women who came before, of. Uh, um, living up to some expectation of, uh, was, I think I can be so viscerally feel this sense of, um, like instead of being present and who are we, what are we right now, it's always those women out, you know, the sense of uh, obligation and accountability to some other entity, which was them out there. And having since become them out there, um, them out there, I realized that them out there is just going about their lives, you know, and it's not, people don't mean to not pay attention or listen or, you know, 
but um, I, I felt like, oh, they don't, you know, why aren't they supporting us more, and why isn't there more awareness, and um, so um, it was fun. It was much more fun in the summer of 85, I think, I can remember, of, of being in, did we have an act? Oh, that was the six minutes of midnight, right? It was in 85. And now I think back, I'm like, oh my God, how could we possibly come up with the idea of having an action of thousands of women in rural New York outside Army Depot in the middle of the night? <laughs> you know, of, like that, that, that was a safe thing to do. And I think, I mean, part of it, one of the amazing things about the encampment was really this believe that we could do anything and that we were safe and that our um, faith and vision and love would conquer everything and that it was, you know, whatever we wanted to do, we could do it. 